There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Well, hello, BookTube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with another edition of Another Words, an occasional series where I talk about vocabulary, words and expressions that I encounter in my reading that are interesting to me, and I look up the etymologies and linguistic research online and cobble together a little episode to talk about them with you. With this series, which is not wildly popular, but has a devoted following, small but eager, some of the a greatest erudition occurs in the comments section below, so do check that out. There's a couple today that I couldn't find out nearly as much information that was conclusive as I would have liked, and I would be shocked if you had more information than I could find online, but I will be eternally grateful if you do. So without any further ado, let's get started. The first word comes from a work of nonfiction that I read early this year. The author is Michael Frank, and the book title is 100 Saturdays, Stella Levy and the Search for a Lost World. I read it from, from cover to cover, ultimately didn't think it was completely successful, but still was very interesting. A uh, memoir about him spending 100 Saturdays with this elderly Jewish woman who had grown up on an island outside Turkey, and some of the more finer details about all that have already left my brain, but... It was interesting. I didn't think it was structured or put together particularly aptly, but Stella Levy sounded fascinating. And the word I have for you today from that book is plangent, which is an adjective that describes a deep, low, and sad sound. Here is the sentence. Stella is remembering her childhood on this island, and she remembers a piercing, plangent voice singing a song of some sort. Plangent. I had a vague idea of what it meant, but it does actually mean a deep, low, and expressively sad sound, like a baritone sax. A sound that resounds especially plaintively, so a plangent bell. In the early 19th century, it also had the connotation of being a, a beating sound from the Latin plangentum, which goes back to plangere, which meant to strike or beat. So you can see how it's evolved. Originally a strike, striking sound, the, the idea of a repeated beating sound, and that is present in the idea of a plangent bell. But once we get to other plangent sounds more modernly, such as uh, the plangent saxophone, I don't think there is, well, I guess it has a beat. So maybe it all maybe it's all connected. I probably shouldn't be talking about this word because I don't really know how to talk about music or tonalities. Be that as it may, the, the word origin is interesting. It goes back to a Proto-Indo-European root, plaque, here it is, that means to strike. And whenever a word can go that far back, right to the top of the etymological family tree, that's when it's so interesting because you can see, you can often trace all of its cousins throughout the dictionary. So, this Proto-Indo-European root plaque, meaning to strike, shows up in these words too. Apoplexy, complain, fling, paraplegia, which we are more familiar with, paraplegic, plague, and quadriplegia, quadriplegia or quadriplegic. So we need to talk about some of these. So apoplexy is a fit of paralysis and dizziness, so you're struck by the symptoms. Complain is interesting. The original meaning of complain was to lament and to grieve. Of course, we use it in a slightly different way more modernly. Grieve. There's a quite an evolution between grieving, which we still use to talk about sadness at someone's death, and grievance the noun form, which still does very much equate to complaint, but it goes back to beating the breast, and that could be in complaint or in mourning, and that goes back to plaque. Paraplegic and quadriplegic. You are struck by paralysis, so that is quite similar to apoplexy. Well, this one's my favorite, but this one is a little bit frustrating because there is an irresolvable lack of consensus about this, but it comes from this novel published about 1947 or something from the UK 
Chatterton Square by E.H. Young. I have a full review of this. The link will be in the show notes. But one of the characters, one of the male characters, is talking about how much everybody loves him at work. And I think it's his new job. I think he's a young guy. Pretty too big for his britches, perhaps. This is what he says. There were a few more days holiday owing to me, and they're so damned cock-a-hoop, I wonder they didn't offer me a partnership to celebrate the occasion. Cock-a-hoop. Cock-a-hoop is an adjective in British English. I don't think it's ever come across the pond. That means extremely and obviously pleased, especially about an achievement. Cock-a-hoop. So this young guy in the novel, uh, he said that his colleagues, his superiors at the new, new job, the new company, they were cock-a-hoop about how well he was doing. So, cock-a-hoop. I don't know how much I want to get into it because it's frustrating. There's at least two major competing theories, and I don't know that it could ever be solved if it hasn't been solved by now. But the one that's perhaps the most popular goes back to English pubs. And to set cock-a-hoop is to set the cock on the hoop. And just by the way, I know that I'm wading into dangerous territory, but this is not some perverted ring toss, all right? There's nothing phallic. Well, you, there's nothing phallic mentioned in what I found. Extrapolate all you want. I must admit I have, but I'm not going to go, go down that path. Apparently, when you set the cock on the hoop, it meant you turned on the tap, the spigot, for the beer or whatever it was. You were, I guess it's always beer, isn't it? And let the liquor flow. So you turn, pull it down usually, right? Or sometimes you push it up. Maybe it's always one way or the other. I don't know. I just drink it. I don't <laughs> serve it. But open the spigot and the, let, the, let the spirits flow freely. And we tend to do that. And people have been doing that for centuries as a way of celebrating good news or something, some achievement or something. So cock a hoop. And that goes back to Thomas Moore. He died in 1535. This piece of his wasn't published in, for a couple more decades. But this is, I'm going to try to read the later Middle English. This is what he wrote. They have found, I'll put it on the screen because, and see how well I do reading it, in, in putting it into moder, more modern English. They have found out so easy a way to heaven as to take no thought, but make merry, nor take no penance at all, but sit them down and drink well. For our Saviour's sake, set cock a hoop, and fill in all the cups at once, and then let Christ's passion pay for all the shot. So, I mean, that's quite obviously a reference to this whole thing about letting the letting the booze flow freely, and there are other occurrences of that in the same era. And some etymologist, his name is Thomas Blount, and he wrote an etymol a lexicographical lexicographical etymological dictionary called glossographia in the 17th century and he said that our ancestors called the spigot the cock and then I'm not going to go down this path because it gets really down into the weeds but there are pubs even extant today that are called cock and hoop and also other things and hoop. What, what are some of the other ones? Yeah, something on the hoop. There's many bars. Swan on the hoop, cock on the hoop, hen on the hoop. A really old-fashioned way of naming pubs. And some of them survive today, or at least the names do. How that's all connected, there's little speculations about, you know, some of the signs for these pubs have hoops on them. But does that really connect with the cock on the hoop, the opening the spigot for the draft beer in the pub? I don't know, and nobody does. So I'm, that's as far down into the weeds I'm, as I'm going to go. Curious to hear your thoughts, if you have any about this. Because the other one is about cockfighting roosters. And, and nobody, and there's such wildly different theories about it. I think that's enough detail, just to say there are certain colorful expressions. I've never heard of cock -a hoop until I read Chatterton Square by E. H. Young. But when you get down into the weeds about what the etymologists say, often, you know, especially when you can get back to a Proto-Indo-European root, um, it's clear or quite clear and fun. But this is a different kind of fun. There's just wildly divergent theories and I don't 
can't see how it would ever be resolved. Um, the next one is one of my favorite expressions and a one that I've long been curious about and at least not online, there isn't a lot of etymological explanation for it and it's my foot. I mean, I've known it all my life, but I encountered it this year in this wonderful novel, Clothes Pigs by Susan Scarlett, AKA Noelle Stretfield. I can't believe how much I love this and I made a note of it without the page number and I can't find it now, but my foot is in here, trust me. My foot, an interjection, an exclamation of, um, the Oxford English Dictionary calls it an expression of contemptuous contradiction. I think Sean the Book Maniac is heterosexual. Person A says, person B retorts, heterosexual my foot. In other words, absolutely not heterosexual. Isn't that, is that a good example? I think that's pretty clear. <laughs> and I grew up with this expression. I also grew up with its non-euphemistic version, my ass, and in British English, my arse. But what I can't find out is, did one come first and the other second? But it makes sense that my foot, just like gosh, is softer than God, that my foot is softer than my ass, or my arse, but I can't find any definitive proof about that, and that's frustrating. But I have to set that to the side. I just love this this phrase. I haven't found anybody that said, why would we say my ass or my foot to express contemptuous contradiction? Like, what does that mean? So there's just this big empty hole in my presentation of this expression because I couldn't find anything. And part of it is, it's their colloquial expressions. So if I put etymology my foot or etymology my ass or my arse, I found about three or four different places, but nothing that really got into the nitty-gritty that I wanted to get into. And then the words themselves are so common that without those word etymology or phrase origin or word origin, you know, you just find a bunch of stuff that's like foot doctors and all kinds of things about arse and ass. So I'm just kind of putting this one out there too. And like I say, some of my deepest enjoyment about doing this series, however, occasionally is the dialogue that happens. So I'm hoping that people will have some thoughts, some inside information. I'm breaking with precedent in that this is not a word I encountered in my reading, although probably I have and just didn't make a note of it, but this came in a comment. And this comment comes from one of my lovely subscribers, and not only my subscribers, but all of your subscribers too, Jacqueline from Ireland. The Friday Reads last year, I think, or earlier this year, was entitled Coughing Up Some Good Books at the Beginning of the Year. Yeah, I was definitely at the beginning of this year because I had such this terrible cough. And so Jacqueline wrote, you might have the lurgy that's going around. I hope you're getting better soon. And I wrote, lurgy? What is that? I've never heard that, but I mean, maybe I have. I thought it was a completely new word, lurgy. So here it is in my, in other words, let's talk about it. The fuller phrase is the dreaded lurgy, and I'm counting on you Brits to, to confirm or correct that I'm pronouncing it correctly. Lurgy, not lurgy, because I did find some pronunciation videos that had British accents that pronounced it lurgy, but the most authoritative ones, lurgy. So this is a catch-all phrase for some nasty illness that isn't very serious easy to spread around, inherently contagious, so spreads easily, but nobody dies. Lurgy. It's often a way of referring to the flu or a bad cold or anything with a nasty cough, so hence Jacqueline's comment when I had my nasty cough. This goes back to the mid 20th century. It was coined in an episode of The Goon Show, 1954. So it was probably invented by its writers and its writers were Spike Milligan and Eric Sykes. I've never heard of Eric Sykes, Probably should have, but Spike Milligan is a pretty much a household name. And the episode title is Lurgy Strikes Britain. So it's more contemporarily spelled with a Y, but originally was spelled with an I. It exists on YouTube, and because The Goon Show was so popular, the expression just went viral in mid-20th century UK. If you don't know, and I don't know more than this, The Goon Show was a really popular British comedy, radio comedy. It starred Peter Sellers, Spike Milligan, and Harry Seckham. Seckham. This phrase, the dreaded lurgy, became so popular it was a schoolyard term. Uh, 
and was uh, flung around having different, slightly different meanings like you smell bad, you've got the dreaded lurgy. And it had made it as far as Australia and New Zealand, but never crossed to North America. According to what I've found, there is some speculation that it is also, it's connected to Northern English. They had expressions like fever largi, fever lurden, and fever lurgan. But those were expressions to talk about being lazy. You have the fever of laziness, so but it could, could all be tied together. So, I may well have had the dreaded lurgy in January, but I'm doing much better now. Thank you very much. Next is another word that I've been curious about, been using my whole life, but I didn't know why it meant what it meant. And now I do, and I want to tell you. The adjective is skittish, and it comes from this wonderful British novel. It came out exactly in 1930. A note in music. In this sentence, our female protagonist is criticizing herself by using this word. Skittish, she said, quite loud this time, in her deep, rough voice. So the modern meaning is being shy and easily frightened, nervous, so skittish horses, right? But originally in English, in the early 15th century, it meant very lively and frivolous. They think it goes back to the old Norse word, skrota, I don't know how to pronounce it, there it is, which means to shoot, launch, move quickly. And that makes sense, but they haven't definitively been able to, to make the link. But I'm going to finish talking about it as if it has been definitively proven because it makes such good sense. But no, at the outset, it's recorded as being perhaps from this word. So that old Norse word that means shoot, launch, move quickly, goes back to the Proto-Indo-European root skud. There it is which means to shoot, chase, or throw. It just all fits together so well. In Northern English dialect, they have a verb skite, S-K-I-T, which means to move by leaps and bounds, and that is connected to skit. And again, there's a bit of a tenuousness. I know I said that everything was going to be more definitive from here on in, but... <laughs> anyway, the early 15th century meaning of skittish to be lively and frivolous. Almost at the same time, it also had the meaning of being shy, easily frightened, apt to run. And specifically, especially horses. A century later, it also took on more figurative associations of being changeable, fickle, inconstant. And even by the mid-17th century, inclined to be coy or reserved. Those are meanings I've never heard. So, if we're going to accept as fact, because it fits so perfectly that there is a connection to the northern dialect word skite, which is connected to skit. Let's talk about skit for a moment. Skit came into English in the early 19th century, meaning a piece of light satire, character, or lampoon. Originally before that, it meant a satirical remark or reflection. And but in the late 16th century, it meant a light wench, a vain, frivolous, or wanton girl. Well, I was really young in the 1570s, so maybe they were talking about me. <laughs> Originally Scottish. There was a verb in the early 17th century. Skit, as a verb. That meant to go off suddenly, to be shy or be skittish. Which they think goes back to that same Old Norse word. And, again, even though it's not 100% sure, let's talk about skud, because skud gives us a lot of other interesting words. So, the Proto-Indo-European root skud means to shoot, chase, or throw. It is the ancestor of so many interesting words. Scot free. We're going to talk about that. Scout. Sheet. Shoot, shot, shout, shut, shuttle, wainscot. I'm only going to talk about Scott Free because this is interesting. Scott meant royal tax. In Old English, Scott Free means no tax. So why does it go back to scood, which means to shoot, chase, or throw? It goes back to Old Norse Scott, meaning contribution, which connects to shooting shot, a thing shot, a missile. And the last word for this episode is from this wonderful book, and I'm so glad because all the other words are from British novels, 
And I don't only read British literature, I also read quite widely and post-colonially. So let's look at The Seven Moons of Mali Almeida by Shihan Karuna Tilaka. And there are probably a hundred occurrences of the word curfew in the novel. And I obviously know what it means, but why does it mean what it means? This is really interesting. In the early 14th century, curfew spelled this way meant evening signal or the ringing of a bell at a fixed hour. And the signal was to put out your fires and lights. And this medieval practice, usually the bell was rung at about 8 or 9 p.m., was in order to bank the hearths and prepare for sleep so that people, whether they were drunk or just worked to the bone, too tired, wouldn't fall asleep with the fire burning and start a fire. That's the original meaning of curfew. Curfew goes back to Anglo-French, couvrefeu, from the late 13th century, which goes back to Old French, very similar version, couvrefeu, meaning cover fire. And the modern French version of that is couvrefeu. Couvre means to cover, and we're going to talk about cover, and feu means fire. And that is actually connected to focus, and this is just fascinating. The idea of not being allowed to go out after that time, being made to be home by that time, and to be stuck at home, that didn't come into English. That sense of it didn't come in until the 19th century. So, cover fire. All I'm going to say about the word cover, because we all know what it means, but it goes back to a Proto-Indo-European root. Were, here it is, and it means to cover. So here are some words descend from that Proto-Indo-European root, and I think almost all of them are really, the link is so clear. Aperture, covert, discover, garage, garment, garnish, garrison, guarantee, kerchief, overt, overture, warrant, warren, weir. That's fascinating. And how does focus fit in? Focus in English, Mid 17th century, I mean a, a point of convergence, and it goes back to the Latin word, same spelling, focus, men, meaning hearth or fireplace, which was a stand in, which meant home and family, the point of convergence. And in fact, if you think about Kepler and fire and everything, focusing something, you can start a fire when you focus your lens on uh, from the sun and all that. That's as detailed as my scientific <laughs> explanations get to be, but I think you can follow me, right? And that is a center of activity or energy. It's all related to fire and the hearth. That just blows my mind. And I said that curfew goes back to couvrefeu. The word fou has evolved in French. And its etymology is interesting. I never talk about foreign words unless I'm tracing an English word back to them, but this one I have to talk about. In Old French, fou meaning hearth or fireplace. I've said that. The spelling and pronunciation evolve further. In the modern French word, I have no idea how it's pronounced, is fou, F-E-U. And it has multiple meanings depending on context. One of them is fire, so that's the original sense. It can also refer to Concepts such as light, signal, deceased, or former. That's, so that's what I got. That was really fun. I hope it was at least a little bit fun for you too. Thanks for watching.